Suppose again that we take the shape of the square. And remember, it's hip to be a square. Anyway, so if we have a square and we take a point at the center of the square, let's do the following thing. Let's draw a line from the center to one of the vertices of the square. We notice that this line goes in a certain direction and has a certain length. For example, we can think of it as a vector. But for the time being, just think of it as a certain length and a certain direction. If we go in the opposite direction, 180 degrees away, and we draw another line, the same exact length, we notice that we also end up at a point of the square. And we notice that if we do this to any single point of the square, it's not able to do the vertices, but if we go in this direction to this vertex, I can go in the exact opposite direction, the same distance, and it will actually also hit a point of the square. If I can do this for any point of the square, I have a third symmetry operation. And this symmetry operation is called inversion. And the symbol that we use for inversion is the small letter i. It's one of the more logical uh, symbols that we use. So we have i for inversion. So we see that this is going to be true for the square. So let's now see if the inversion operation is an operation of the rectangle as well. So let's try um, for a um, triangle. Let's try a triangle. So let's draw, for example, uh, as best we can, an equilateral triangle. Let's draw an equilateral triangle. And the center of the triangle is right about there. So let's do the same trick that we had just done with the square and draw a line, a line segment, from the center to one of the vertices. So let's draw a line in this direction. Okay. We notice it has a particular length. Now we want to draw a line with exactly the same length in the opposite direction. So let's see what we get. If we draw this line, it's going to go to roughly about here. So that's where the line segment would end up. And we notice that this particular point is not on the triangle. So what this tells us right away is that the triangle, at least the equilateral triangle, does not have inversion as an operation of the shape. So we see that it's no inversion for the triangle, but there is inversion for the square. So let's move on to something like the hexagon, which is a challenge to draw, but let's do that. So we have the hexagon. So we need our six-sided regular hexagon. The hexagon is going to be an important shape for us because uh, the benzene ring, for example, is a very important chemical shape uh, that is shaped like a hexagon. So let's see if we can draw these line segments that happen to follow the rule for inversion. So if we draw a line segment in this direction, and we draw one the exact same length, 180 degrees away, we see that it actually lines up with one of the vertices. If I go to the right by a certain distance, and then go to the left by the same distance, it's going to also line up with a vertex. If I go sort of northwest to this vertex, if I go exactly in the opposite direction, I'm going to see that it does line up with a vertex. So we see that the hexagon has inversion as one of its symmetry operations. As a general rule, let's just try one more example of our regular n-gons, and we'll quickly be able to determine a useful rule about when inversion is going to be present. So let's draw a pentagon as best I can here. Not particularly good draw. Let me draw a somewhat better pentagon if I can. There we go. So this gives us a rough idea of the regular pentagon. We'll see that there are uh, important molecules that have the shape of a pentagon, not just the Pentagon office building in Washington, D.C. So now we have a center point, and let's draw a line segment from the center to a vertex of the pentagon, and then one in the exact opposite direction, and it should come somewhere about here. So we notice that 
even starting with the first point, that it doesn't follow the rule for inversion. For inversion to be true, this has to uh, work not just for any one vertex of the shape, it has to work for every single point of the shape. If there's even one point for which it does not work, then the molecule does not, or the shape, does not have this inversion operation. So one of the things that we notice is that the uh, inversion is going to be present for the square and the hexagon. And what we notice, for example, is that the square has four sides and the hexagon has six sides. Okay, and then there's going to be no inversion for the triangle or for the pentagon. So, what we can recognize, and this is three sides, and this is five sides. We can recognize pretty quickly is that when we have an even number of sides, so an even number of sides for our shape, if it's a regular n gone, then the inversion operation will be a symmetry operation of the shape, whereas if we have an odd number of sides, inversion will not be one of the symmetry operations. So at least for the regular n gons, this will be our general rule. Uh, let's just try one more example of an important shape that isn't a square, hexagon, triangle, or pentagon. So let's look at the rectangle. The rectangle uh, will be a more important shape than it seems at first glance, but let's just take a look at a rectangle and see what we have here. So we draw a rectangle. Let's draw it sufficiently different that it's obviously not a square. So if we imagine where the center point of the rectangle is going to be, it would be there. So let's draw a line segment to one vertex. If I go 180 degrees in the opposite direction, I see that it actually does line up perfectly with a vertex of the rectangle. And then we do the same thing with a different color here. If I draw from the center to this vertex, I can draw a line the exact same length in the opposite direction that does line up with the vertex, if I draw it accurately. So we see that the rectangle, even though it is not a regular n-gon, it is not a square, it still has the inversion operation. Now, inversion may seem to be a somewhat obscure symmetry operation. Uh, looks nice, but one may wonder exactly why it is of such importance. Well, it turn out that it's very important chemically to be able to distinguish between molecules that have inversion and the ones that don't. If they do have this inversion operation, we have an adjective that we can use to describe that shape and or molecule, and that adjective is centrosymmetric. So if we have a molecule that is centrosymmetric, it means that it does have has the I operation. So it has inversion. And we are going to learn a little bit later in the course an extremely useful way, chemically, to be able to distinguish between molecules that have inversion and those that don't by using the techniques of analytical chemistry. We actually have a straightforward uh, pair of techniques that we can use. Uh, we run two tests, compare the results of the two tests, and we can immediately determine whether the compound we're investigating is centrosymmetric or it isn't. And uh, these techniques can be run essentially at any laboratory in the world, so it's easy technique as well, and the ability to use a technique that is both easy and powerful is something we should always be looking for. So, so far, we've looked at three symmetry operations. We looked at one called the proper rotation, the second one, the mirror plane. The third is inversion. The fourth one is a tricky operation. And we'll give it just a brief introduction to it because it's often very difficult to describe uh, on a board and it's easier to see with models. But the fourth symmetry operation is called the improper rotation.
And the improper rotation uh, is a almost a compound operation in that we can think of it as two operations performed in a sequence. So the symbol that we use for an improper rotation is the letter S with a subscript N. So for example, one example of an improper rotation might be, so we can example, would be an S3. For example, S4 are improper rotations. So let's see what the definition of an improper rotation is. Well, for an SN improper rotation, it involves two steps. The first step is an ordinary n-fold rotation. So for example, if we're talking about an S3, the first step would be to do a C3. So we do a 120 degree rotation. Then we follow that rotation with a mirror plane inversion, so a mirror plane reflection. So we actually reflect horizontally with a horizontal mirror plane. So first we do the n-fold rotation. So that's an n there. Here is a sigma h, so we do a horizontal mirror. Now it may turn out that for a particular object, even if it has a sn improper rotation, it may turn out that it doesn't have sigma h and it doesn't have this as individual operations of the shape, but this combination is actually a symmetry operation. So for example, if we're talking about an S3, the way that we make an S3 improper rotation is to first start with a C3, so an ordinary C3 operation. So for example, a 120 degree rotation in the plane of the board, and then a reflection in the plane of the board through a horizontal mirror. And this combined two-step operation is a symmetry operation of the shape. Now, it may seem artificial to have this kind of a symmetry operation. We'll see later on that it's quite important that we define improper rotations. And remember, we had said that one of the key features of a shape is the exact number of symmetry operations. To accurately describe molecules, not only do we need proper rotations, inversion, and mirror planes, but we need to accurately count how many of these improper rotations are available. We're going to look at this one a little bit later on because this is the most difficult one to visualize and the hardest one to, to wrap your mind around. But we're including it right now just so that we've included for the sake of completeness and it will become more important as we progress through our study of group theory. As we progress through our study of group theory.